Welcome to this special edition of the Global Health Insights podcast at the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation. I'm Pauline Chu in media relations. As we mark the third year of the pandemic, we look at how COVID impacted mental health around the world. Elise Ferrari and Damien Santamauro are affiliate assistant professors at IHME, based out of the Queensland Center for Mental Health Research at the University of Queensland. We know that mental health was and still is such a huge concern in the pandemic, and both of you have looked extensively at um, depression and anxiety. So, uh, Elise, let me start with you. After researching uh, the, the, the many studies and the countries globally of where depression and anxiety stands, with different demographics, what would you say the most important insights are that you're taking away from this research? Yeah, so it, it became pretty evident early on at the beginning of the pandemic that, you know, COVID was creating an environment where a lot of the determinants of mental health were being impacted, and particularly the determinants of common mental disorders like depression and um, anxiety disorders. The work we've done essentially tracked how the prevalence of these disorders changed during 2020 and 2021. Um, and we did see an increase in cases of depression and anxiety disorders as a direct result of the pandemic. What we saw were that women were tended to be more impacted than men. Um, youth, um, children, adolescents tended to be more impacted than older populations. Um, what we also saw was that countries um, where infection rates for COVID-19 was highest, countries where um, they had been most impacted in terms of mandates, in terms of lockdown, they were also more impacted. So, uh, Damien, let's narrow down those two groups, um, women and younger people. What is it about those two demographics uh, that depression and anxiety hit the hardest? So we suspect that um, one of the reasons why women might have been impacted a bit more is um, the, the employments that um, that women tend to be in tend, were more impacted by you know the mandates by the lockdowns. Um, they and with the less secure employment, um, so more more likely to lose their their jobs their, um, because of uh, you know on average lower income, more likely to have less savings um, to kind of buffer any kind of financial difficulties there. Um, we saw that. Uh, prevalence of domestic violence also increased during the pandemic and that's a risk factor for depression and anxiety um and we also know that you know women took a, a big brunt of the the house you know the, the kind of the caring responsibilities um when people got sick when children couldn't go to school uh so you know women faced quite a lot during during the pandemic um and we believe this might be why there, there were larger um prevalences of, of depression and anxiety uh among women among youth, um, their youth are more likely to be impacted by, um, like if there's an economic shock, uh, they're more likely to lose their, their jobs, you know, less financially secure at the time. So they're more likely to feel the brunt of these financial uh, financial shocks that we saw uh, that came about when the pandemic started. Um, what was a surprise to me though was, uh, you know, when I started this work, my hypothesis was that we would see greater prevalence in the older population um, because I thought that the lockdowns, the mandates would, would lead to more social isolation, that, you know, potentially the, the he um, health being a bit riskier, that that might be a greater risk of infection, there might be more anxiety there about catching um, COVID-19. But we just didn't see that in the data. We consistently showed that that um, youth were, were more likely to have elevated prevalence than, than, more, than senior people. Do you know why you didn't see uh as a heavier prevalence in the older population because as you as you said that was the worry at the beginning of the pandemic is that they are the high risk population i'm i'm not too sure to be honest it was it's still a surprise to me uh today yeah El elise do you have any thoughts yeah i mean it, it it's possible that that effect is there, but the surveys that, you know, we work with are not picking it up. Um, if elderly populations are more at risk at COVID, perhaps they're less likely to be participating in these sorts of surveys. That's kind of one premise. So it's more about us not finding the data yet rather than, you know, that effect not existing. 
Um, it's also possible because, you know, a lot of those social determinants that we saw impacted early on are things around employment. There are things about, um, you know, being sort of less able to move around your community, about not going to school and, you know, not being able to, you know, be more social. And those things perhaps tend to be, um, you know, the change we saw tend to be more evident in sort of the working age group or the younger age group, as opposed to the elderly age group. Um, it's important to recognize as well is as we're progressing through um, different phases of the pandemic, the impact, the mental health impacts are changing. And, um, you know, those trends that we saw in 2020 with women and the younger populations being more impacted that's changing as well so we saw a little bit less of that in 2021 and we're still digesting sort of the data from 2021 to make better sense of it so that's encouraging to hear that the trends are changing and mm. and for the better yeah uh, and as you have uh, identified these determinants and and you've got the data and you're seeing the trends what do we do with that information now? Like, how can policymakers and the public use this information? I think it's it's important to answer that question. It's important to recognize that mental disorders was a leading cause of burden before the pandemic occurred. Um, and we hadn't seen a reduction in that burden at the global level. You know, we haven't seen that in the last 20 years leading up to COVID. What COVID um, did was essentially it was a population shock that meant that cases of depression and anxiety disorders increased further, making that burden, you know, grow even more. It's important to learn from this in terms of how a population shock can change the prevalence of mental disorders and how the res government response to that needs to be, because, you know, COVID was this big shock that basically changed everything when it comes to the landscape of mental health services and how people were accessing services for mental disorders, um, you know, in 2020, it's important for us to learn from that so that we're better prepared for the next population shock that comes along, whether it's an economic shock or, you know, a shock around conflict, war and violence, so all these things that we already know do impact on, on the prevalence of mental disorders. So that's one thing we're keeping in mind when we are thinking about research that's to come, how can we take this method that we've developed to measure the impact of COVID and adapt it so that we can measure the impact of another population shock. So it sounds like it's an investment issue, an investment of, of where you put the resources. And, and I did see a statistic from the WHO saying that in low-income countries, there was less than one mental health worker per 100,000 people. So if you take that statistic and and, uh, and magnify that, I mean, what, what does that, where does that leave you in terms of where do you even start with with investment? Um, there's been a lot of work done around how best to scale up um, interventions for mental disorders in in resource poor populations, and how we we would go about that differently in a in a low income setting than we would in a high income setting. It's also about um, you know, prioritizing getting treatment to people who needed the most, those experiencing the most severe, the most debilitating um, symptoms or disorders when it comes to mental disorders. There is a lot of literature out there showing how particular, you know, intervention strategies can help decrease symptoms of mental disorders. So it's, I guess it's just about getting those um, strategies and those platforms for scale up um, to policymakers. Um, and in a language that they understand they're able to listen to. And I think GBD does a, a good job at kind of putting that data out there and you have all the platforms like the Countdown for Global Mental Health 2030 that is also you know, a good mechanism of doing that. What more data would you like? So one of my biggest concerns, I guess, during this task, to be honest, was actually the data quality. Um, when we were compiling all this data, there was such a large amount of um, noise that we had to filter through. Um, and so our, our hit rate, I guess, for good quality data was so low compared to what was out there. And even today, you know, I, I would I would much, I, I really want to see a lot more of, of these high quality surveys coming out 
Um, and some of these are starting to come out. So we've got, um, you know, the Australian National Mental Health Survey that, that just recently came out, which is a, a very good quality random um, population survey with diagnostic interviews, um, and that some of these surveys are coming out as well uh, around the world. Um, but there, there's, I would like to see a lot more of them coming out and in a timely manner so that we can actually analyze this data and react accordingly. I'm glad you brought up the quality of data because the Countdown to Global Mental Health 2030 has just come out with its report and its dashboard. And uh, they do talk about countries that are missing data. Well, I think um, the Countdown to Global Mental Health 2030 dashboard is important. It's essentially a monitoring platform. It, it holds within it um, a wealth of indicators around mental health. So that can range from the types of indicators we generate as part of the Global Burden Disease Study, so prevalence and burden estimates, but also it has indicators around attitudes towards mental health, around stigma. It has indicators around service utilization, um, around environmental impacts or other social determinants of mental health. Essentially, when we put all of that together, it's, it's a monitoring platform that allows us to track how these indicators change over time and essentially hold governments, uh, policymakers, and all the stakeholders accountable for how these indicators are changing and whether it's within the direction that we need to reduce the burden of mental disorders within those countries. I mean, we've seen in the GBD that, you know, data can be a very powerful tool, health metrics can be very powerful, um, and, you know, the Countdown to Global Mental Health is another example of sort of a tool we can use to try and guide the mental health response in different countries. There's a lot of data missing, you would have seen from the tool. That's true in the work that we do within the GBD as well. Um, and it's it's important to take the opportunity to kind of recognize that, but also use these tools as a way to highlight where the big gaps in the data is and where more research on mental health is needed. And Damien, did you want to add to that with about the report yes, of the dashboard? Um, yeah, just that I think that one of the biggest limitations in this field is um, is that the uh, limitations in in where we get the data, so that the gap that those data gaps. M most of our data that we tend to compile um, does tend to be from uh, high income countries, and the the data in low middle income countries does tend to be quite sparse, um, and. In our work, we try out very, very hard to try to compile these data sources, just because it, it they're, they're so um, important to you know to offer proper representation of of um, of the of the globe you know the globe of, of the global population. Um, and in GBD, we have this philosophy that uh, we leave um, no no gaps. We leave no gaps in our estimates. Um, because uh, when there's no estimate available, it uh, is often interpreted as, well, that doesn't exist. So if we say there's no prevalence, we don't report a prevalence of depression um, in a location where there's no data, then um, that's often actually interpreted as well, like we're not even gonna look at depression in that country um, because there's, there's it, if we're just gonna ignore it, there's no data available, it's often treated as if the prevalence is zero, which it isn't. And so we, we often try to, to find ways to in incorporate um, maybe neighboring data sources or, or try to um, find ways to, to still generate a model a modeled estimate for for every location where we can um, so that there is no there are no data gaps and so that um, you know we don't have no one can can make that argument that there's oh well we don't have to worry about depression or anxiety in our country because it doesn't exist when it, it clearly does. So is the solution to spur governments to actually invest in doing these surveys or, or private donors? Um, I, I would put that on the onus on the governments. If, if they want, uh, governments should be motivated to have good data of mental health in their own locations, uh, in, in their own countries, that's, that's relevant to them. So if they don't have that, then the, the next best uh, estimate will be something that's derived um, either through a modelled estimate or through um, from a, a neighbour neighbouring country or a similar country. Um, but you know, I would say that governments should be, if they're prioritising mental health, but they should be, they should be trying to find you know, where how many people are going to um, 
be experiencing disability from these disorders? What's the, the current service use in, in, in my country? What's the, the service demand in my country to help inform their uh, policy decisions? Well, hopefully this podcast and the dashboard will, uh, will work towards that. Damien and Elise, thank you so much for the conversation. Thank you, Pauline. Thanks, Pauline.